Jack Shaheen talks about the depiction of Muslim Arabs in American movies and argues that this portrayal, largely negative, has shaped the way Americans view Arabs and U.S. policies toward Arab countries. This program from Emory University in Atlanta lasts about an hour. Good evening. Thank you for coming. On behalf of the Department of Middle Eastern and South Asian Studies, I'd like to welcome you all here uh, for what promises to be an informative and exciting event. It gives me very great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Jack Shaheen. Uh, Jack is a good friend to many of us here. He has been to Emory a number of times before, to Atlanta many times. He's appeared on CNN and spoken in Atlanta as well as in this very building. Um, Jack is the world expert on media images of Arabs, uh, really bar none. There is no one who does what he does better than he does. He's known throughout the world. He has been a consultant to the major news networks. He has written highly acclaimed works in this field, and he is the expert. So we're very lucky to have him here and to have him as our friend. Um, he, uh, his academic background, he's a professor emeritus for, of mass communication at Southern Illinois University. And he has spoken at universities, in lecture halls, in Europe, in North America, uh, many, many different countries. He is perhaps best known for his work, Real Bad Arabs, How Hollywood Vilifies a People, which appeared in 2001 from Olive Branch Press, and this is the cover here. You can still get this, it's not too late. Um, and he also has written a number of other books. Earlier he wrote a book called The TV Arab, and he has a number of other uh, books on, on media images. His most recent work, well first I should mention that Real Bad Arabs was just met, made into a documentary, and we're going to see some of that, I hope. Um, it, and this was put out by the Media Education Foundation. And uh, Jack has spent thousands and thousands of hours going through movies and analyzing the images of Arab characters in movies. And he has distilled this for you. And the latest uh, fruit of his efforts is this new book, which has just come out this year, 2008, from Olive Branch Press also. That's in North Hampton, Massachusetts. It's called Guilty, Hollywood's Verdict on Arabs After 9-11. And we're going to hear about this today. But this is just hot off the presses in the last month. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank uh, very much Ghada Mohanna and the Aleph Institute, our local Arab cultural institute in Atlanta, for helping us out with the uh, logistics and with the support of this event. So please welcome Jack Shaheen. My friend uh, Devin always says things that make me blush. And I want to thank you so much for that very gracious and kind introduction. I, I consider myself a, a friend here at Emory, um, primarily because I do have friends here and you've had me back over and over again. So each and every time I return, I sort of hide in the hotel room and look over all the notes that I used before and then I throw those aside and I have to start anew. And so tonight, for the very first time, uh, I, I, I haven't seen the book. This came out, it went directly from the printer to here, to Atlanta. And so I, I, I'm a little nervous and very excited about it. I thought this evening would be special for a couple of reasons. One is, well, let me begin by saying since most of you here are students who care about the way things are in our society today, the future movers and shakers of our society, let me paraphrase Chief Dan George. When you talk to people, you get to know them. When you don't talk to them, 
you don't get to know them. And the thing you do not know strikes you with fear. And you destroy the thing you fear. You destroy the thing you fear. Flashback from Chief Dan George to India several decades ago. An American clergyman meets with Mahatma Gandhi and he asks Gandhi what causes him the most concern. And Gandhi looks up, pauses and says, quote, the hardness of heart of the educated. Saying, quote, the educated classes liked him personally but had a horror of his views, end quote. So tonight, I hope that you will like me personally, and also that you will find my views not horrifying, but enlightening. Two years ago here in Atlanta, there was a court case. Uh, an American Muslim was being tried. And afterwards, there was a journalist from the Atlantic Monthly who came and who spoke to one of the jurors in the case. And this is what this one juror had to say. The Arabs and Muslims are everywhere. I don't know exactly who they are, but they all have the longer hair. And it's hard to distinguish within the race who is who, end quote. The jury's foreman reportedly made a similar comment, quote, if you put them in the same costume, they all look alike, end quote. And actually, those two quotes from a court case here in Atlanta just two years ago pretty much summarize how most of us think about Arab Muslims. I say Arab Muslims primarily because it's, although there are 1.3 billion Muslims in the world and Arabs are a minority, the group that is constantly vilified over and over again are Arab Muslims. You know, Atlanta is the birthplace of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. His life, his lifelong quest was to contest and eliminate stereotypes that damage a people. And King's dream was shared by so many people. And it's a dream that needs to be embraced by young people to go forth and to make things a little better and to challenge discriminatory portraits of all groups. This month also is Black History Month, which is our history too. It's the history of discrimination against all people, Asians, Latinos, Native Americans, Mormons, Arabs, the Irish, the Italians, Southerners who were tagged Bubba, you know, he wears a red cap, shotgun in the back of the pickup truck, and he beats the dog. And Southern Bells, you know, sitting around drinking mint juleps, waiting for gentlemen callers to come a-calling. All of these stereotypes. It seems we always need to have someone to pick on, someone to make fun of. Now, how did someone like myself, I'm from Pittsburgh originally, I hope... Those of you who cheer for the Falcons won't hold that against me, that I'm a Steelers fan. But I was born and brought up in a small steel town in Pittsburgh. And before we get to the substance of the talk, I wanted to share with you how I came to address this topic. How did I become interested in addressing stereotypes? Well, we had an integrated school system back in the 50s and the 40s. Blacks and whites went to school together. But after school, blacks lived in one part of town and whites lived in another section of the city. It was segregation. And my African-American friends at the time, I felt that. We never talked about it, but I felt it. And I remember one summer, I, I went from my small steel town to a town called Lebanon, Kentucky. And in Lebanon, Kentucky, I was working in a liquor dispensary, tending bar. The steel mills were on strike, and there I was behind a bar without a southern accent, a Yankee working in the southern town. And I remember one day, one of the owners of the bars came up to me, and he said, you know, we need help. He said, you've got to go over to the Golden Horseshoe. He says, that's a black bar. 
and we want you to work there. And I said, okay. So he takes me over to the Golden Horseshoe, and the first thing he does is he hands me a pistol. And he says, if any of those, and he uses the, net, the N word, give you a hard time, here's the safety lot, shoot them. Just shoot them. And again, I was 19 years of age, and that had a profound, a profound impact without my ever knowing it. And then after that, serving in, right after, well, right after the Korean War, I was in, uh, in Germany and gone to Dachau, feeling and trying to understand man's inhumanity to man. From there, a, a Fulbright scholarship to Lebanon, where I taught for a year at the American University of Beirut. And so all of these sort of, these places and times sort of helped shape the way I began to think and see people. When I got back from Lebanon, I wrote an article called The TV Arab. It was about, oh, maybe six pages. Oh, I loved the article. I was so excited. I sent it in to forget, you know, I was going to get it published, you know. I was going to be the first one to talk about Arabs on television, and no one wanted it. And any academic knows the struggle. When you get 50 rejection letters over a period of three years, you have a choice. You have a choice to stop and do something else, or you continue. And I guess the, 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 uh, the pollution from those steel mills gave me the willingness to pursue this issue. I, I was determined to get the article published and to move forward on how we perceived Arab Muslims in American popular culture. What also helped, too, that all of a sudden at the university, instead of the Pittsburgh professor, I became the Arab professor. The Arab professor was not meant as a compliment. I was labeled, I was tagged. All of a sudden, the research that I was doing, the lectures that I gave, became subject to extra special treatment. Anyway, now, years later, I came out, as Devin Stewart mentioned, with Real Bad Arabs, how Hollywood vilifies the people. This book came out in June of 2001, uh, just before 9-11. And in the book, I documented more than 900 movies where Arabs are vilified as the cultural other. At the time, it was an expose of the stereotype. We were not at war. Um, the insurgent threat was not necessarily in the headlines, there was, Al-Qaeda was off on the side. We were not into Iraq. Afghanistan was not being talked about. And then 9-11 came about. 19 Arab Muslim terrorists responsible for the death of nearly 2,000 innocent Americans. When 9-11 occurred, all of a sudden, the paranoia and the hatred and the fear that we had against all things Arab and Islam began to escalate. All of a sudden, we began to really fear and hate all things or most things related to Islam. The war put a different perspective on it. After all, I mean, we've lost what, almost 4,000, 4,000 American men and women in this conflict. And so, I was, at that time, not sure what to do. Uh, should I write another book about post-9-11 images of Arabs and Muslims? Has anything changed? Is it more important to address it now, to think about it now? And I decided, again, the stubbornness, I guess, or the determination of the mills of Pittsburgh and my own upbringing, my own family, that taught me never to hate anyone or dislike anyone or to criticize anyone because of their color, their culture, their creed, their gender, to move forward and to work on this book. And what, I've, what I came up with really are 100 plus post 9-11 films that vilify Arabs and Muslims. But within the context of 9-11, has anything really changed about these images? What, what has taken place? 
And, and in the introduction of the book, I talk about the importance, the political significance, more so than in any of my previous writings, of the political role that these films play. In other words, all films, to one extent or another, are political. They have a point of view, a political point of view. And these Hollywood movies and TV shows have an impact. They have an impact on policymakers. Media have a tendency to follow policy, and policy look to media to spread their agenda. They reinforce each other. It's a vicious cycle. And if you look historically at the role of cinema, it's played a very, very important role when it comes to propaganda and war. Back in, I'll give you just a few examples. World War I, you know, the, 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 the Belgians, and, and, and they, they sort of sent out posters of the German Hun, you know, killing babies, bayonetting babies. And, and you, you had these horrific images of Germans. They weren't called Germans. They were called the beastly Hun. It's a good exercise. I mean, go, uh, go Google World War I posters, and you'll see these images of Huns bayonetting babies. Well, if you take that image of bayonetting babies, and we go, we're going to fast forward now to the Gulf War. One of the things that helped us get into the Gulf War was the fact that on Capitol Hill, a young woman was testifying saying that Iraqi soldiers were pulling out the incubators at the hospital and killing babies. They were killing Kuwaiti babies. And she was, you know, in detail, she was describing you know, the brutality of the Iraqis. So we take an image from World War I and we transpose that image up to the 1990s. The bayoneting, not necessarily, the, the brutalization of babies. Now we didn't know, and to show you how journalists, the best journalists, our finest journalists, fell down on the job, so to speak, and go with the flow, go with the flow. Not one journalist asked who was this girl that was testifying. Who was this young woman? What was her name? Was she credible? No. You know who she was? She was the Kuwaiti ambassador's daughter. She had been coached by a public relations firm in Washington, D.C. It was all a lie. It was a big myth. There's a wonderful book by Philip Knightley that you should all have. and you should, you should treasure it. It's called The First Casualty. Because during times of conflict, truth is always the first casualty. Film has always played a role in the demonization of a people. We learned this here in our own country with the manner in which Japanese were portrayed by the motion picture industry and the newspapers of William Randolph Hearst, by the way. So when it came time to incarcerate Japanese Americans, more than 100,000 American citizens, American citizens, no one said anything because they weren't Americans. They were Japs. Japs. We called them Japs. And so we didn't have, they didn't have an identity in American popular culture, Japanese Americans. And what little identity they had was negative. It was not very positive. So it made it that much easier. If we go to Nazi Germany, the Holocaust and the demonization of the Jews, you know, over and over again, by, by not only in Nazi cinema, but in newspapers, editorial cartoons, the dime novels for Native Americans, the Latinos, you know, the greasers, the lazy Mexican with the sombrero sleeping on the street, not going anywhere. All of these images shape how we think and how we feel about a people. And today especially, we are a visual society. I mean, how much time do we spend with books versus how much time do we spend looking and expanding our derriers, watching television, watching films, playing video games, on the computer. That's work on the computer, though. Most of the time, right? I think it's most of the time it's work on the computer. But we are. We're becoming more and more visual. And so this media curriculum is teaching us whom we should love and whom we should hate. And you tune into most network channels, you know, whether it's CNN and you're watching Glenn Beck thinking that there's a Muslim hiding behind every corner ready to stab you with a knife, or Bill O'Reilly, you know, who's sprouting out all kinds of venom or Ann Coulter. I mean, they're all over the place, and Rush Limbaugh. I mean, these men and women are making a tremendous living, saying horrific things, and no one says a word. 
No one says a word. You know, when Real Bad Arabs, How Hollywood Vilifies the People came out, I thought, wow, this is going to be a, 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 major, a major breakthrough is going to return, no, uh, occur. No. Most people reacted with yawns of indifference. This stereotype is as fixed today as it was when it, it's even more pervasive today than it's ever been before. It's been with us for more than a century. More than a century. If you, actually it's impacted every man, woman, and child alive today. Grandparents, great-grandparents, children, grandchildren. I mean, you can't escape it. Almost each and every week on television, they're, they're rebroadcasting the old movies. And these movies, cinema never dies. Cinema stays with us, regardless of the year. How many of you watch Turner classic movies? A great channel, right? Before I give you, I'm going to give you two examples of the power of cinema. You ready? Black History Month, I have to talk about Birth of the Nation. One movie in the early 1900s, that movie did more to bring back the Ku Klux Klan than any film in the history of our country. That film showing blacks as brutes out to seduce white fair-haired women as drunks, basically as animals. One film before DVDs, before cable, before television, this one film all of a sudden brought about the reemergence of the KKK, which affected the political process in certain southern states. Now, some of us, I, I, I love this part of the lecture, like to say, well, those beer drinking people may buy that stereotype, but not me. I'm educated. Well, guess who loved Birth of a Nation? President Woodrow Wilson, one of our most educated presidents, thought that it was all so terribly true. He embraced the film. There was a special screening for Wilson at the White House, and he thought the film was just great. So sometimes we can't see. You know, we get so accustomed to an image, to a face, that we cannot see the images, the damaging images. We take it for granted. Now, the other example about film's enduring impact. In 1975, there was a movie called, and I'm sure most of you have not seen it, fortunately, Ashante. It's with Michael Caine and Peter Ustinov and William Holden and Rex Harrison. And it's about Arabs taking young African Americans across the desert and brutalizing them sexually, physically. It's one of the most racist films of all time. And after it evaporated or disappeared from movie screens, we all breathed a sigh of relief. And then three years ago, I'm in Prague, Czech Republic, with my family. We're going to midnight mass. And someone turns on the TV set. And there it is, a German TV station beaming into our Czech hotel room, the Hollywood movie Ashanti. You know? So these films go on. They keep popping up. These images do not evaporate. They, they stay with us. I want to give you now just a few examples of, of some of the, what I call real, R-E-E-L, negatives of the movies, the post-9-11 films. Probably the two most damaging one is the kingdom. I don't know. The kingdom, uh, we have in the kingdom, uh, the protagonists are two FBI agents, an African-American man, Jamie Foxx, and a white woman, Jennifer Garner. And they go over to the Middle East, and I guess they gun down anywhere between 30 and 40 Arab terrorists. When I was growing up, the most feared image, the image that was embedded in our psyches, the image that no one wanted to see and thought about was the white man or the black man and the white woman. And fortunately today, that's gone. At least it's gone in some aspects of our society. Because you have in the kingdom and you have in the movie The Siege, a black man and a white woman working together. But they're working together to do what? To kill Arabs. And they do it very effectively. 
very effectively. The other film, I guess, um, I, I'm, I'm hoping most of you missed it, was called Hidalgo. Hidalgo, where the American who's, he, you know, we used to have cowboy and Indian movies when I was growing up, and the Indians always got it, you know, they always got it in the war paint. We always shot them dead, the cowboys were always on the side of, you know, they were the barbarian Indians. And in this movie, Disney was very smart. They made the protagonist half Indian and half cowboy. And his assignment was to go to Arabia, win the desert, rest, uh, desert race, and wipe out as many Arabs as he could. And that's exactly what he does. He goes to Arabia, he has the blend of the cowboy, and he has the, you know, he's Native American. How can you not like him? How can you not cheer him on in the end to beat all those nasty, mean-looking Arabs? Okay. Then I have another chapter called Real Positives. I wanted to bring some balance, and there has been some improvement. I, I recommend in, in this book, uh, I, I think even-handed films, almost 30 out of 110. Whereas in Real Bad Arabs, 950, I only recommended 6%. And, and there were two or three that are really first-rate films that I recommend. One is Babel, which shatters stereotypes of Arabs, as well as Mexicans and Japanese. It's a beautiful film. It's a film about commonalities and how much we share with one another. I highly recommend Babel. There's a film called uh, Syriana, where almost everyone in the film is evil, except for an Arab sheikh and the young American protagonist. That's also, I think, an excellent film. And a hidden film called Yes. It's a Sally Potter film with Joan Allen. And for the first time in hint cinema history, an Arab man is able to love an American woman and vice versa. She takes him instead of him taking her. Okay? She takes him. It's a beautiful romance. It's a lovely compassionate, tender story. You know, the one issue uh, people of color historically have been demonized. In the early days of cinema, it was the Indian, it was the Asian, it was the black, and they all basically, the attributes were pretty similar. They all lusted after the white, fair-haired lady. They were all, their god was different from our god. They lived in a primitive dwelling, Asian huts, in the jungle, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and fortunately, to Hollywood's credit, many of those images, those stale images from the past, have been addressed and taken care of. Now, we have real negatives, we have real positives. What about impact? What impact do these images have on our men and women serving overseas when they see? literally dozens of films, hundreds of films, of American servicemen, Israeli secret agents, civilians, etc., 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 blowing up evil Arabs. What do they think? Does it make them, when they're stationed overseas, want to befriend and know the Arab people? What, what images come to mind? Or is it like in the, in the movie Jarhead, in the book Jarhead, do our soldiers, men and women, watch these movies to get pumped up before going overseas to get visions of the people? What impact, this is why now, more than ever, it's essential to study these images in popular culture. What, Im what impact do these images have on the Arabs themselves? What do young Arab men and women who really may not like our president but like our democracy and like some of the things that we stand for, like freedom of speech, and want to come here and study, what do they think when they see these films? Do they go to this? I mean, what would we think if there were more than 1,000 movies from the Arab world that vilified us the way we vilified them? Would we think they like us? What would our reaction be? And why in the hill of beans isn't someone doing something about it? We've had a public relations effort to win the hearts and minds, supposedly, of Arabs and Muslims that, you know, is about as effective as trying to sell Coca-Cola to a Pepsi addict. No one has addressed Hollywood. No one is talking about mainstream media. 
No one speaks out contesting and condemning the racist dialogue and images that exist in our media on a regular basis. You know, I, 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 I must say, I, I'm almost invisible on television anymore. Nobody really wants to speak with me. And I don't know whether it's because I have gray hair or whether it's because the issue uh, is no longer relevant or no one wants to hear this particular point of view. But it's frustrating, particularly now at a time when we need to address these images because these images, these wor words and images are weapons. They teach us whom we should love and whom we should hate. And we have to at some point sit down and examine what we can do. You know, entertainment is a great teaching tool. You know, the propaganda films were not as effective in Nazi Germany as the entertainment films of Leni Riefenstahl. They were much more effective as propaganda than Hitler's propaganda movies. And so we must address the issue. Now, what about solutions? What can we do to resolve the problem? Well, if I knew that, but I am going to propose that we have an Arab American summit, an entertainment summit, based on an entertainment summit that was done 20 years ago that looked at images of, of uh, Americans and the Soviets. It was a very successful summit. It was held in the mid 80s where Russian filmmakers and American filmmakers met here and also in Russia. And they exchanged ideas. They got to know one another. And at this summit, we'll invite Arab filmmakers. We'll invite American filmmakers. We'll also invite some Israeli filmmakers who have done terrific films with Palestinians like The Syrian Bride and Paradise Now and Rana's Wedding, all very good films, those co-productions of very liberal Jewish Americans and, and, and those Palestinians from the region, and then discuss the issue. We try in, to set up, in a sense, more of a presence in Hollywood of Arab Americans and Muslim Americans who can tell their own st stories. My big fat Arab wedding, why not? You know, Abdul's return, I'm proposing that, that we revise and bring back the old Charlie Chan movies you know, only Tony Shalhoub would be Charlie. You know, we won't make him Chan, we'll call him Charlie Habib. And we'll get Selma Hayek to be his right hand. I mean, Hayek and, you know, and Shalhoub together, are you kidding? It'd be a great series of mysteries. But of course, you know, I doubt if anyone will do that, but I'm proposing it anyway. New films, young talent, opportunities. And then we need a clean sweep of television programs. We need to sort of expose the racists of television. Now I'm going to get very, very strong, and then I'll wrap it up. As an American with, with Arab roots, I, I've grown, we, we are invisible. Uh, Arab Americans are invisible on television. Arab Christians don't exist. I mean, the vast majority of Americans are, are American Arabs are Arab Christians. And the only time we've ever been visible was way, 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 way a long time ago with Danny Thomas and Jamie Farr running around with a dress in M.A.S.H., the lovable character, Jamie. But after 9-11, producers, after 9-11, producers of shows like 24, Sue Thomas, FBI, Navy, NCIS, The Unit, and others, Sleeper Cell, all of a sudden began to paint Arab Americans and Muslim Americans as terrorists. I've documented more than 50 television shows that have done this. And then they blend us in with terrorists from overseas. And it all started with CBS. They produced a movie called The President's Man, A Line in the Sand with, you know, Chuck, go kill them all, Norris, back in 2002. And in that, you have Arab Americans in Texas you have Arab Americans who have been educated in some of our finest universities trying to set up a nuclear bomb in Texas. I find that morally and ethically, eth morally and ethically reprehensible. You know, if, if I were a lawyer, I'd take them to court. Because I feel the men and women that produce these shows, it, it makes as much sense to vilify us as any other group of Americans. We had nothing whatsoever to do with 9-11. 
We are the champions of freedom and justice. We contribute to our society as much as anyone else and care and love our country as much as everyone else. We don't have to have a flag in our lapels to show that. The flag is here and the patriotism and the love and the respect is in the heart. So you don't have to flaunt it. But over 50 television shows, three out of six seasons of 24 depicted us as terrorists. Three, not one year, not two years, but three seasons. And if you doubt my, question, my, my thesis about uh, entertainment being political, look at Navy NCIS. An Israeli agent, a Mossad agent, her name is, fictional name is Ziva David, helps our intelligent agents bring down Arab American and Muslim American terrorists. Now, I, you know, I put, I write in guilty, let's see what happens. If the producer was really, felt that this was really apolitical, you know, he would put in uh, Leila Haddad helping the secret agents from Palestine bring down terrorists. Now, do you think our television would accept that? Hmm? Do you think they could get away with that? Okay. The most important thing that you can do, I think, as young men and women, and those of us here with silver hair in the audience, is to speak out. Uh, stereotypes take a long time to wither away. And by speaking out, I mean not to remain silent, even if it's to a friend, because silence means approval. And I think, again, being in Atlanta and thinking of Dr. King and Black History Month, uh, King, King said it perhaps better than anyone. He said the, the, the people of ill will have just gotten their way. Wait, you know, they've just gone on and on and on, and we need the people of goodwill to become movers and shakers and to contest these stereotypes. So I ask you, in the name of peace and justice, because these images can bring us closer together, fair and balanced images of all people can bring us closer together and can help bring about peace. It's not the final solution, but it's a diplomatic tool. And to ignore this tool, I think, means that we ignore the prospects of peace. So let me conclude. I have to read this. I'm sorry. I wrote it. But I have to read it. There are two prayers I'd like to conclude with. Oh, by the way, thanks again for having me. And um, whether we meet again here in Atlanta, Aleppo, or Anchorage, to one and all, I leave this Cherokee blessing and an Irish blessing. May the warm winds of heaven blow softly on your house, and may the great spirit bless all who enter here. And now to the Irish blessing. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God continue to hold you in the hollow of his hand. Thank you very much for having me. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. They have two microphones down here. Yeah. Actually, I don't think I have the microphone. Yeah, I think they, they, they'd like you to, so you'll be on C SPAN. Hello? Hello? Hello, C SPAN. Anyway, um, I'd like to first thank you for coming here. I'm, I'm sure everyone here agrees that uh, you know your you know your speak has enriched your speaking has enriched all of our uh, educations here. But um, <clears throat> I'd like to pose a, a just a possible question to think about. Uh, have you ever considered that uh, Hollywood is simply responding to the realities of today's uh, world in terms of the fact that? Like recently, I, I checked out the uh, State Department website on terrorist groups, and currently, 24 out of the 22 religious-based terrorist groups are Islamically based. And um, <clears throat> I was wondering if possibly, you know, you could entertain the idea that Hollywood is simply responding to a reality that terrorism and 
specifically Arab Islamically based terrorism and even more specifically Saudi Arabian cultivated terrorism is an uh, enormous problem in you know in American culture that you know Americans think about on a you know regular basis well I, I, I would certainly not want Hollywood never to do a film about Arab and Muslim terrorists the problem is If those are the only images we see, if we are only able to see the images of the lunatic fringe, what are we to think of everyone else? In other words, where's the balance here? There are 1.3 billion Muslims in the world. And how many films show us, quote, those people, end quote, like us? I mean, that's the problem. Historically, that has and continues to be the problem. Uh, believe me, I, I, I don't minimize the threat. The threat exists and it's there. And it should be addressed in popular culture. But at the same time, do you think it's fair that television producers portray American Arabs and American Muslims as terrorists, as helping members of Al-Qaeda? I mean, I, I mean, that's... That's where we, we run into, I think, some, some, some issues here. I, 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 it's interesting in the book, uh, I, I'm sure all of you will get the book, it's interesting in the book that there are television critics and film critics, that's, that's all the images they want. They want to see those images, and only those images. Uh, Goebbels, this is another, I think, uh, quote that you can kind of scribble for notes and impress your teachers. Uh, in order for propaganda to be effective, you repeat the same images and you repeat them over and over again. So what we have are images of sameness, selective framing, okay? Selective framing of the cultural other. Yeah, yes? Um, sort of going off that question. First off, thank you again. I really appreciate this. Very enlightening. Um, in terms of the kingdom, actually, I'd read a lot I don't remember where, but in particular addressing the issue of balance and that this was sort of one of the first times that Hollywood tried to show much more of a, a real and fair sense of Arab culture which, and uh, Muslim culture, especially in Saudi Arabia. And that was something that I took out of it a lot, you know, in terms of the parallels between Jamie Foxx talking to his son and the officer Farris speaking with his son. I'm curious, because uh, you'd cited one of those as a negative thing, how I guess did you consider the way that main like life was shown in the kingdom? Well, well the kingdom begins with, with the horrific slaughter of Americans in Saudi Arabia, one which never took place. And it also shows Arab children as terrorists. That's a, that's a theme in, in the movie Rules of Engagement as well. It, it advances that film. And uh, I, I credit the producers of the kingdom knowing they were going to get flack. And so what they did is they inserted a very positive Arab character, the policeman, who of course gets killed at the end. And I guess you could say to some extent that's progress. It's like having birth of a nation and all the blacks are trying to seduce white women, but there's one black standing up and saying, you know, an African, don't seduce her, don't seduce her, you know. And I guess you could point to that one image and say that that's progress. But by and large, every Arab in the kingdom is a terrorist, even the child at the very end. Uh, I, I've got an op-ed I can, I, you want to leave me your email, I'll send it to you. I, do you ever, um, thank you again, but do you ever look at other media that portrays Arabs in a negative way? Because I know that recently there's all these Go Army commercials, and in order to recruit young people probably around college age, they have um, soldiers kind of living, I guess, in deserts and places like that, and then it cuts to another scene and you see Arab garb um, dressed men with machine guns, and it's kind of like they're definitely the enemy who the American soldiers have to go out against. So do you ever look at that? Well, I, you know, I work alone. <laughs> I mean, I, I, wish, I wish I could be here at Emory with, I mean, I had to watch all those movies by myself. <laughs> With, I, I mean, I, I, I do, but I, I simply, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, someone uh, suggested I watch uh, 
By the way, uh, if anyone teaches a course here called Film is Propaganda, they've got to get the DVD called Obsession, all about radical Islam. Uh, someone pointed me to that. It's a documentary that was done um, in 2006. And, and, and I knew what it was about, but I couldn't force myself to watch it. And finally, I saw it before I came here. And it's just, you, you can only, one person can only do so much. It might be something you could write about. I mean, no, I'm serious. You could do it. I mean, the one good thing about this particular issue is that no one's writing about it. And no one's talking about it. And it's an ideal opportunity for young scholars, video games, they're wide open, commercials. I mean, I would love someone to do a paper on Glenn, uh, what's his name? B-E-C-K, Glenn Beck. I mean, Keith Ellison gets elected to Congress. You know, I mean, he's, he, he's elected. And the first question Beck asks him is, why should I trust you? You're a Muslim. And let me ask you, oh yeah, you, you, you really, this is the question I wanted to start off with. They're slamming Barack Obama, those people that don't like Obama. And one of the techniques they're using is, are you ready? He's a Muslim. So what? What if he were a Muslim? Oh, oh. If he were a Muslim, do you think he would have gotten as far as he is today? Would he be where he is today had he been a practicing Muslim? Or what if they discovered Obama had Arab roots? <clears throat> you see? You see how, you know, almost 50% of Americans today think that it's okay to restrict the liberties of American Muslims. Almost half of them. And it's due in part to those images and the hate rhetoric that goes on and on. You're welcome. But I'm encouraged by young people like you. You know, you saw that and you picked that up. So you should really tape those and write something about it. Yes, sir. I just have to say when you when you cite a list that the State Department has put together, I, just, I can't find it credible because the United States is the only country that I know of has been convicted by the World Court of Terrorism, in this case against Nicaragua. Thank you. Oh, oh by the way, let me, uh, before I take your question, I do want, I'm, I'm, for all those politicians watching out there, I did volunteer my services gratis to assist our country in, in, the, in the war to win hearts and minds. And I'm still available. So if they really care about, in, you know, having someone work side by side and trying to alter perceptions, I'm here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you very much for coming and raising these, these issues because it makes you to think about it. And I want to make a comment and then I want to make a suggestion. The comment, the, the first uh, uh, person who raised the question about the number of the Muslim terrorist group, if he really reviews it, he will find it the number is much more or less. And it shows the propaganda that our media is, is, is doing it. If you look at the Europe, you'll find 2% terrorism come from the Muslims, 98% start from the you know, occupation of, call it Ireland, or call it the Basque, or call it anywhere else, you go to South Asia, occupation breeds the terrorism. Israel occupies the lands that they were not supposed to. Even America forbids settlement. Nobody talks about it. Is that not a terrorism? And counter results is what we see it, the human lives are gone both sides. The suggestion I was going to say the name Shaheen is is or Sheen, you know, are, are known all over America. You folks are in the leadership. Why not we should have a block voting? Let's see the, what the legislature does it for us. We are the American citizens. When we are blamed, let's ask them, how could they expect me voting? We will vote only for them who really do something for us. So as a suggestion, <laughs> you know, you go right there. Maybe. Well, no, this, this Shaheen has nothing to do with politics. You probably mean Jean Shaheen up north and her husband, Billy Shaheen. No, I, this Shaheen is just a humble, retired, renewed college professor 
and I have about as much power in the political system as I do in my own home, which isn't very much. <laughs> but thank you for that, for your words of encouragement. Shaheen is a very common name in, in the Middle East and also in India and Pakistan. Um, whenever, I, um, whenever someone gives me a hard time, I, I say that it really comes from an Irish knight who went to Jerusalem uh, and on the crusade, and his name was Sheehan. And he met this beautiful woman and decided to, you know, to marry her and settle there. And she said, well, you know, Sir Gwain, or whatever his name was at the time, um, Sheehan and Shaheen are one and the same. And you know, if you change it to Shaheen, you'll be accepted. And so he changed his name to Shaheen, and that's why I have blue eyes today. But that's not true. <laughs> yes, sir. Warm greetings, Dr. Shaheen. Hi. Um, my question for you is, um, is it the films that Hollywood puts out that's the problem, or is it Hollywood itself? And my question is, why do you spend so much time watching these films? Is it, is it really a source, should we st keep focusing on Hollywood as a source of, of information and news and forming our ideas? And do you make a distinction between Hollywood and some sort of other filmmaking? Yeah. Well, I, I, I focus primarily on Hollywood because I think movies, perhaps more than any other form of entertainment, have the most impact worldwide. So that the ugly Arab, the Arab is terrorist, Arab equal Muslim, equal enemy other terrorist, is as prevalent here as it is overseas because 60% of the profits of the motion picture industry come from overseas. So I, I think it, of all, you know, you, you have the news, it comes and goes, these films last forever. Uh, two, why did I watch the movies? Because this is a very sensitive issue. I, I didn't let any research, I didn't have any research assistants, but I wanted to be responsible for everything that was written myself. And I felt that the only way to make the case that Arabs are the most vilified group in the history of cinema is to look carefully at these films, to study the images and the dialogue. I can assure you, I would have much rather been out playing tennis, walking the beach, doing almost anything but watching these films. Because the research process was extremely painstaking. First you had to find the films, then you watched, you took notes, then you had to watch again, take notes again, then you had to put it in the proper context. And when you get to over a thousand films, that gets to be rather, it's, it's difficult. But when you study anything, if you study the films of any uh, Stanley Kubrick or Scorsese, or uh, it, 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 it's time, and, and, and what really pleases me or makes me, um, I guess somewhat optimistic, is that people are seeing the stereotype now in some of the films that I wrote about that they didn't see before. And there is a growing awareness of the pervasiveness of this image. And, and I'll just quote uh, Jack Valente. Uh, Jack Valente was the chairman of the Motion Picture Association of America for many years. And he has a quote, write this down for class, Hollywood and Washington spring from the same DNA. Okay, end quote. You're, you're welcome. Thank you. We have time for one, two more questions, and then two more questions, and then, uh, is that all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll have two more questions, yes. Hi, uh, thank you, Dr. Shaheen, for coming to talk with us. I wanted to know, uh, I've, I've been interested in Arab media specifically and its portrayal. Uh, I've noticed a lot of negative stereotypes of uh, specifically Jews and Israelis. I wanted to know what you think can be done to sort of uh, combat that and how, how that can be addressed. I think you make it visible. I think you make it visible. You write about it, you write to the people that are doing it. I mean, that, that's, that's, that, that's what you do. I mean, I, again, it's something I haven't studied but I, I would address it. I, I think that the moral, or at least what I've tried to convey here, is that you, know, you should speak out no matter who's being targeted. <laughs> I mean, just because you have, you know, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm an Arab Christian, Arab American Christian, right? And I'm talking about Muslims 
and Islam. And if, 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 if it were Jews, I would feel the same way in Judaism. I mean, you have to, you, I mean, we're responsible for the, you know, for taking care of our neighbors. And so, yes, by all means, that's what, that's what I would do. I mean, let them know. I mean, write an intelligent letter. Do research on it. Get it published. Now, you're welcome. One more question. First, I want to say uh, uh, thank you for coming. And um, my uh, first question was, um, what do you think, um, or uh, who do you think is the uh, 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 main uh, beneficiary of uh, the vilification of a people? Meaning, what's the uh, uh, driving force uh, uh, behind this um, phenomena? And um, do you think it's just do you think it's just for uh, 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 to make money because that's what the target audience wants to see and that's how they perceive the real world? Or do you think it's more that uh, there's a, a, a deeper political, uh, uh, like uh, deeper uh, political uh, um, motives um, <laughs> driving the... Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Thank you. Uh, it's political, number one. The Arab-Israeli conflict plays a predominant role. If, uh, if Palestinians and Israelis were at peace, um, they'd be uh, making dozens of films about them doing the hora and the dubka, you know, embracing one another. Semites would be kissing. You'd get fed up with all these Semites kissing each other on the cheek, you know, um, because of the commonalities. But, but they're not, unfortunately. And so politics plays away. Some, some people think that these films by vilifying Arabs gives a greater security to the state of Israel, which is not true. Greed plays a role. These films make tons of money. The Arab, I mean, it's the only group you can pick on today and get away with it. I mean, I mean, you go to any other group, look out, you're going to get it both barrels. You're going to get it from the critics. You're going to get it from the journalists. You're going to get it from politicians. You know, you're, you're just going to get attacked but not with Arabs and Muslims. You know, it's safe territory. And I think a lot of it has to do with fear. Remember the quote from Chief Dan George? We have a tendency to fear what we don't know. And in this case, the fear of Islam. You know, when I was growing up, it was the red menace. And now it's the green menace. Oh. We have to somehow unlearn our prejudices. And we can do that I think by trying as best we can to take action and to contest. Be a mover and a shaker, like Dr. King said. It's a good feeling, really. It's all right. Anyway, thank you very, very much. We want to. Jack Shaheen is Professor Emeritus of Mass Communications at Southern Illinois University and a former consultant on the Middle East for CBS News. He's the author of several books, including Real Bad Arabs, How Hollywood Vilifies a People, which was made into a documentary.